The title of my presentation is Commercialization Challenges Software Development and Exponentially Fragmenting Ecosystem. Uh, the presentation itself can, is already up, uh, uploaded at cmoreforhire.com slash mobile development. So if you wanted to go there at any point, um, and you can guys get the link uh, from our Twitters or whatever tomorrow. Um, yeah, and I'm here with uh, Riley Curl tonight, who's uh, VP of CMO for Hire. I'm president of CMO for Hire, amongst other things. And we're going to get... Um, so tonight's chat is um, four topics. The magic of hope, the reality of revenue, the winds of change, and the power of people. That's what we're dealing with tonight. I'm pretty sure those are all songs from the 70s, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that's all, it's all good. Who knows how come... I have a Simpsons brain. That's all pop culture. Um, uh, the magic of hope. As software developers, it goes in this order. Don't crash, don't suck, and get sticky. All right? So we, ultimately, we don't want our, our software to crash on user systems. Ultimately, we don't want them to get one stars to us. And ulti ultimately, we want them to give us five stars and have repeat um, usage of our software. Right? So that's what they call get sticky is. Get sticky. Now, speaking of hope, here's this young lad way back in the day. Oh, is that you? Totally is. Oh, yeah. I love these. Thank you so much. In fact, that computer is this one which I sold at one point, but it came back to me. So I'm going to pass it around. Enjoy this little piece of artifact. This is a Atari 400. It actually has a, a basic cartridge what, what in it. There? What's that? What were you playing there? That's so much. That was my first computer game I ever wrote in 6502 assembly language. Castle of? Tray God. Oh, and there's, this is the uh, external um, storage system. It's a little cassette really? system. Cassette this was originally shipped, shipped with 16K. I upgraded to 48K. That was a glorious day. This is awesome. Um, there's a few other things in this picture that you should think about as we think about kind of where we've come since this. Uh, just press down on that. Yeah, I get to, and they get these cartridges. Yeah. Yeah, it's a 6502 processor, 1.79 megahertz. So that puppy is humming along. So, so there's some other things in this picture that are of interest. First of all, my desk is as, de is as messy as it is then as it is now, as is my mind. Um, on the far right, there's a little Walkman. You can't see the whole thing, but it's a little red thing. And up top, there's a record player, of course, with an 8-track. And it's kind of, a, um, we're going to get into some kind of trending and future forecasting, et cetera, in a, in a little bit. But it's, uh, the pace of change is all very interesting. In fact, I did a calculation. What's that? Um, I did this calculation that my Samsung S5 is 3 million percent faster. There's some 6502. 3 million percent faster. Now, it was a hard calculation because it's like this is a quad processor, whereas and it's 60, this is like a 2.7 gigahertz versus a 1.79 megahertz. And it's an uh, 8-bit bus on the Atari versus a 32-bit bus. And there's a whole bunch. And the screen here is like 700 times more resolution than that guy had. Um, so it's hard to tell. But I figured 3 million percent faster is, is about right. And... Um, yeah. It's a good round number, yeah. yeah. And accelerating. So that's kind of where it started. And then um, I don't want to get too much about this journey because I get all nostalgic about it. But a bunch, of, a bunch of years turning bits into gold with great teams. The metal plate came off the computer. Oh, really? You, what? I can't even trust Mobile Monday. Just uh, have, maybe pass that over here. There you go. It's all good. <laughs> but that's metal, man. You don't get that in computers these days. Um, yeah, so I started, uh, when I graduated from university with a computer science degree, I did Teledon, which was a precursor to the internet. Uh, the standard in, in uh, worldwide was North American Presentation Low Level Protocol Syntax, or otherwise known as NAPLIPS. Oh, yeah. Uh, but Teledon was Canada's version of that, and they actually was, was fairly successful in connecting some uh, Canadians. Um, I moved east or west to Calgary, and then I started in tax software. First, can tax software, and I started a, a company tax uh, software with these guys here, which we eventually sold to Intuit. We became the professional division in Canada. Um, and along the way, I kind of traded. I, I like to say I wrote a million lines of code, and up to three of them are comments. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, but I turned to the dark side. I started doing marketing stuff, and then business. So there's there's a couple of hat hats that are in, and brains that are inside the skull. But um, at Intuit, I became the chief marketing officer for Intuit Canada and as well as a director for um, uh, Intuit down in the U.S. And we did, I, the biggest thing I did down there was a $500 million global expansion plan that I left them with that they're still quasi-executing on. So. 
those are the good days. And then I left there in 2007. I took a, a, a year off on grass, on the grass. That's basically what I did in 2007. It's a great year. Um, but then I came back and I founded some uh, companies like Mob for Hire, um, which we're going to talk about in great deal here, detail here. But also I work for Curb Dental and Tax Cycle. And then in the far right hand corner, we have my most recent companies, which is Steptokin.com, which is my consultancy, uh, more or less, uh, that Riley's been working with me uh, for a couple of years. And then CMO for Hire. Um, I have to ask Dokin. What's Dokin from? What's that? Dokin. Steph Dokin? It's Dutch for Stephen talking. Really? No. This is a this is a branding uh, Steve exercise. Dokin. Steve Dokin is um, is Japanese for wealth and prosperity. Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're doing this perfectly though. <laughs> this is um, a power brand is only what it ever becomes when when all is said and done, right? But Steph Dokin um, is uh, my wife's name is Stephen Doris uh, Stephanie Doris Kincaid. Mine is Stephen Douglas King. And at one point we formed a holding company, so it's Steph Dokin which is the common initials of our name. And uh, then when I ended up consulting, I, I had to bill a client, so I just started billing them. And then, so that became Steph Dokin. And it's actually been this kind of weird kind of, is it an agency or is it the, that guy? Is like, and riley has been around for two years and Diane and, and Chris is now. And so we formed CMO for Hire as, as an entity that does the, the actual marketing management services and things like that. Um, along the way, uh, lots of awards. I became quite proficient at winning global awards. It was awesomeness. And um, that and a buck fifty will get you a cup of coffee. <laughs> and since 2001, uh, we work with a number of different brands doing basically some brand work, uh, uh, monthly managed uh, marketing services, as well as uh, surveys and market research. Um, and be, you know, just basically a monkey's lunch of what you need to bring a product to market, right? Oh, I, and on an ongoing basis. Um, we do contribute a lot to the local uh, community. I'm a co-founder of the A100 and a director there. I was an executive resident at Accelerator YYC. I helped with Startup Calgary, uh, Mobile Monday Calgary, obviously. Um, Accelerate AB, I'm quite involved with, and some other things along the way. Yeah, so. Hmm. Sumo for Hire, a little plug. Our dragonfly comes from the notion that businesses are all swimming around the murky ooze of the internet and every once in a while one of them gets to break free and becomes this majestic beast that's agile and powerful and strong and um, and that's basically what we try and help companies do so we do stuff like our digital brand audit that's probably what we're strongest at is just analytics and KPIs and actually just putting some process to the big mountain of data that's face faces in marketing but but um, also uh, PPC stuff, AdWords, organic um, SEO work, blog posts, um, and social media, and everything you need to kind of run things on a monthly basis. And we're really good at working with internal teams, depending on your capabilities. So, right. So let's, yeah. So let's rewind the mobile industry by seven years. If you go to slideshare.net slash Um <laughs> The uh, well, another one of my uh, um, names on the internet, um, but uh, I've got a whole bunch of presentations up there, and I did two presentations in the past. One in 2009 called, uh, which was the first one I did, commercialization challenges of software development in a fragmented mobile ecosystem, and a couple of years later I applied it to the enterprise mobile development space, um, which was my most successful. I've had over 10,000 views of that guy just because. The guys on the front look so friendly. <laughs> that's that's um, uh, Paul Potenin was was my partner at Mob for Hire. He's a great guy actually, um, and uh, b a big fella. Um, yeah, um, and, and in fact, uh, Paul came from the. Uh, in, it, I don't know if you guys knew this, but kind of from the years 2000 to kind of 2007 ish, uh, Calgary was like a powerhouse of wireless technology. There were several uh, multi-million dollar companies here. Um, his brother, I forget the name of the firm, I was trying to remember it, but they worked for a, a firm in Calgary that, that was putting up, um, um, negotiating um, land use for towers that went up, because that all had to occur at one point, right, for this mobile thing. <laughs> and so that's what his company did. Um, in one day, his, his value of his net worth changed $11 million <laughs> on the way up when the stock, stock was public. And his brother basically cashed out the next day, he, and he moved to Vancouver Island, and they, that, that was it. He was retired, and um, yeah, and it went. The stock went up to like ninety dollars, and then went back down to thirteen by the next week. It was just crazy, and so many people held on to their 
uh, share price. But that's, you know, that's uh, the stock market and volatility. <coughs> the point being, there was a very, uh, there's a very thriving history of, of wireless um, success here in Alberta and here in Calgary especially. So, um, so back in the day, 2008, so I'm going to pull a couple slides off that 2009 because I kind of want to take you, I don't know if, how much you know about this stuff, but I'll take you on a little journey about what was going on then. And um, if you look at the handset manufacturer share, um, you know, Nokia was uh, by far the dominant guy and the, all these other guys had some share and whatnot. And they had different operating systems, Symbian and whatnot. Um, 30 companies in the next share, Grim, <coughs> Apple, whatever, each have a share of less than 2%. So that was in wow. <laughs> 1998. Yeah. Who had a Nokia? What's that? Four. Who had a Nokia? <laughs> yeah. I had a <laughs> the hardware was so good, but the software was just like, what? I can't use this. And this was the, the this is why it was so damn difficult. Like the fragmented mobile ecosystem, like it was really fragmented. All these different handsets. Then we've got, yeah, all these different operating systems. Symbian was like the, the number one operating system, which is crazy. Um, um, they, well, they were acquired by Nokia along the way, and then they cost, kind of lost their independence in terms of their innovation, cause, and, then, and then you'd have all these great Nokia hardware things, and like Symbian was like, pick from the following six menu items. Right. Um, yeah, and then Windows Mobile, actually Windows Mobile blew it uh, at, the, at the very, very front. They could have been a totally dominant had they just done a left and right, and we all know BlackBerry got really complacent about, you know, no, one, no one's gonna wanna play games or download apps. Um, yeah, so that was interesting. And then the ports, when the ports had to happen, the ports were crazy builds. Um, when uh, Glue made uh, transformers, they had to do 25,000 different builds of their software. Oh, that makes my stomach. Yeah, and, and uh, everything you're experiencing now on, on doing relative screen uh, positioning, all that kind of stuff, that's all built into your language and stuff now. That, none of that stuff existed, right? So different screen sizes were such a nightmare back in the day. And then to make things worse, each carrier had different OS implementations on each handset. So, um, you know, Blackberries were notorious for this. They'd go in and do a deal with whoever, and then they'd get to do an OS version of Vodafone on a Blackberry. And then you'd have an app that runs fine in Toronto, but doesn't run fine in Madrid, right? So, um, yeah, so it was, uh, those were crazy, crazy days. Um, so we created Mob for Hire, which was, this was our attempt at solving the problem that they had so many handsets to test on, right? So we created this virtual online community and um, kind of at our peak when we were running, we had 42,000 users in 146 country on 360 over operators waiting to help you with your project. And so the Ds are developers and the Ms are little mobsters is what I used to call them and the Ps are our partners. So our, our, we, we had uh, uh, development communities and things like that. Commun products looking pretty good. Hey, Mobfire, it's not a bad little deal as CEO. Now, that was important for two reasons, is that I missed the iPhone uh, store, app store launch by about a week. Um, so that wasn't even part of anything at that point. And secondly, uh, the day after I took over as CEO, we hit like the bubble burst. And so like everyone's portfolios crashed. And so here I was, uh, I ended up raising about a million dollars for this company, but boy, it was hard. <laughs> and then like literally in nine months, a billion downloads um, and, and we'd talk to developers and they'd be like, no, we just write on iPhone, we'd use a simulator and we just release it. It's, no, we don't have to test it, it's all good, right? So it really kind of changed, uh, unfortunately changed for us what was going on in the marketplace. And then secondly, um, this also happened too in that uh, Android just took right off to the detriment of these other um, operating systems. So interesting, Apple's sales have actually been pretty smooth over the years. They don't sell more or less than their percentage. They just, they've got their target market locked in. Android sales have gone crazy and everything else has died a low and slow and painful death. So two platforms emerge, right? Android and iOS. And Microsoft, I, you know, Microsoft 10 came out, whatever, a couple years ago. And I just, I had such high hopes, but does anyone here use a Microsoft Windows? Uh, phone? I was no. in Prague and everybody had Windows phones. Right. That's all they could afford. I pulled out my iPhone and they were like... <laughs> it's all they could afford? So they're cheaper than the Androids over there? And then you got bugged. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, so that's kind of what happened. Over, and so, uh, so our pivot, and everyone talks about pivots, but what we ended up doing is trying to go, okay, what else, what else could we do with this big crowd that's not about handset testing? And so we actually looked at um, kind of how, how do you get user feedback in all 10 steps of your mobile development cycle? This is still available if you want to download it. Some of the content's actually um, um, still kind of very relevant. But we tried to build this uh, suite around this, uh, which was don't crash, don't suck, and get sticky. And, um, and, and have more things. So for example, we were doing SIM testing for a company um, globally um, who needed to, they were selling global SIMs and, um, and they needed to test in Egypt or in Israel or whatever the case may be. So we did some of that hardware testing. Um, but ultimately, this was a story of just, um, just a, a, a number of things. Obviously, uh, a shifting demographic, shifting technology landscape that, we, that who would have guessed like Nokia would have died so quickly and iPhone, like back in the day, that in hindsight, it's completely obvious, but at the time, no one had any idea. And I, w I remember going to the Mobile World Congresses at the time in Barcelona and, um, and the big guys just basically laughing about iPhone because it, it looked like such a toy, right, um, at the time. So it, there was a lot of arrogance in the industry around it. It was, it was fascinating. Um, so. One of the biggest problems with this whole business was it was, it was crowdsourced revenue. 79% of the gross revenue went to the U tester and 21% was the companies. So we had to make all our profitability out of that slice. And so we were one of the first crowds kind of source testing companies at the time. So, um, uh, and, and you really need to have lots of volume. Another big problem that we had was a lot of testing is one to many. So I need to get 50 people to test like a $2 test and then coordinate all that back to a, a central point. And it was, uh, we ended up having to put a, man, a, a manager to manage the, the projects and uh, the profitability has kind of started to really kind of uh, suffer because of that. So, and lastly, testing, there's so much downward pressure, pressure on testing. Had I, had I kind of had a little bit more forethought, I would have run right on the marketing side of things. And because there's money going into marketing, there just was not money going into testing. In fact, developers, you guys know yourselves, like no one ever has enough money for testing and enough cycles for testing. And it's always this bastard cousin of development. No matter how much we ask for not to be bastard cousin, for us to walk hand in hand. But anyways, you guys know how it goes. Um, yeah, and to get MVP to market and we'll, uh, we'll get, um, We'll, uh, we'll iterate. And then we also had, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a state, when you're trying to scale a business, you want to have like your four Ps taken care of. Like here's, here's the product list. This is what it does. This is how much it costs. How many would you like, sir, right? Um, and each of these became a different quote along the way. So it was very intensive. And ultimately we exited to a Chinese company and, um, uh, and it was, the whole thing was translated to Mandarin. And it, it could be the Alibaba of testing in China. Who knows, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah, so that's um, the, so the next. That's a segue into the reality of revenue because revenue, at the end of the day, is the thing that is the reason we get to do what we love to do. And a business without revenue is just a hobby. I don't know where you guys are in your entrepreneurial cycles, um, but I do know that. Um, one of the problems that we had at Mob for Hire and other companies I've been with, we get so excited about the solution, so excited about solving technical stuff that we forget to solve for the money side of things, and that's what kills us a lot uh, in businesses. Um, when we think about revenue, I always like to say we're in two types. There's only two types of businesses available to all of us as entrepreneurs. There's either vitamins, where we create uh, revenue from an opportunity, uh, or it's a pain pill where we reduce our time or expenses for our customers. There's only two types, and the better we understand that and the type of customers we're serving, um, the better it is. And Gary, you know that's a hard chase, isn't it? Yeah. Understanding what customer and where you fit in that, the, the supply chain. Um, and this is another thing I always push when I'm doing mentoring stuff, which is how much can you charge for it, which is the most important question to answer. In the end, you're, you're literally making up this little uh, fancy spreadsheet um, which is, um, you know, dollar, your, your income is going to start at zero and it's going to reach up to here point and it's literally going to be dollars per transaction times number of transactions. Expenses, the other mistake I see um, startups uh, and uh, young entrepreneurs doing is we don't plan for a salary for ourselves, so um, the actual profitability of this company is, is a little bit further because um, the, the guy um, doesn't, isn't taking a salary yet. So. Uh, Yes, so you have to do that for expenses. And then our funding is either an investment of dollars or, um, or an investment of our time, one of the two. And that's how, kinda, that's how long we have. 
Um, I'm not going to make you read all of this stuff, but these are my kind of eight rules of looking at an opportunity and going, you know, is this something that we should be investing our time in? You got to ask, why are we doing this versus before you start going, what are we trying to do? Yes, you can get that off the slide here. Uh, <clears throat> the winds of change. So, um, as I say, this was a lot of fun to kind of look at the peer into the magic ball and kind of go, hey, what's going on in the world right now in this whole technology operating system area? So, uh, Android and iOS are, are totally dominant by the year 2020. Um, uh, although it's not predicted that iPhone is going to pick up any more share than they have, which is fascinating to me. And Windows Phone <coughs> will have, for some reason, they must be doing a release, projecting a release that year. But it bumps up and then it kind of withers away again. <coughs> is that the dead cat bounce? <laughs> it totally is. Man. It totally is. But, it, but overall, uh, there's this lady, uh, her name is Mary Meeker. And if you don't read her reports every year, th this is one of the must reads of, of my year. Um, she, this is like a 260 page report on the state of the internet and a whole bunch of other stuff. What's clear to us is that smartphone growth is, uh, smartphone growth is slowing down and Android holds a clear market unit share advantage. So that's kind of the Android strong point. And then the other side, strong point is iOS actually delivers more money to developers. So that's kind of the other side of the coin. And I think in the end, the two of them are here to stay for, for sure. Right here, just because it really framed, this is from uh, uh, 2014, not 2016, but it, it still framed fragmentation as the, the still the biggest challenge as a mobile developer. Um, uh, mobile fragmentation, it's, it's interesting. Um, we have shifted from many types of mobile OSs, but we've now landed on many splinters of OSs. Um, so that uh, causes consternation. I love this little graphic, uh, which sh shows kind of the number of handsets and the sizes of handsets relative. Open Signal does a great job of this data. Uh, but now there's 24, that, this is just Android, and the different companies are making Android handsets and the sizes they're making them for. Okay. More, but this is really just kind of, you know, it's a precursor to the Internet of Things because it's not just people mobility, there's devices that are mobile. And we have to take, as developers, you know, there's APIs between all those little devices and each of those little devices all have their own competitors for platforms of each of their little devices. And, um, and in fact, if you take it to the next level, um, the Internet of Things is really only one of kind of eight-ish disruptive technologies. My, my good buddy, Jim Gibson, um, Jiggy Jag, I like to call him, if anybody knows him. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, he is uh, writing a book called Tip of the Spear, and the whole idea is that the, the tip of the spear is our disruptive, uh, uh, disruptive technologies. Now, anything, any, eight, any one of these technologies has the power to change um, human civilization to the extent of a Gutenberg press or nuclear fission by themselves, but what we're really noticing is the exponential effect of artificial intelligence and robotics and drones together with, uh, you know, uh, big data or quantum physics, right? Or quantum computing. So, uh, so we have this exponential. So what's going on is the tip of the spear is disrupting and the civilization is the shaft and the tip is getting a further and further from the shaft because our ability to, to handle this stuff just on a, a psychological level, let alone technical level, is, is really kind of just being stretched. And I think in the next five, 10 years, uh, it, it's going to be more crazy than we've ever, ever seen it before. So. Um, I'm all excited about that. Technology is good. Um, our um, friends over at Red Iron Labs. Does anybody know Lloyd, Red Iron Labs? Do you guys know him? <coughs> so they have an Indiegogo campaign going on right now, which I, the URL is cut off, which is too bad. But at the very least, go there. Go to Indiegogo, search for abduction, and just kind of click around on their page for them because the more, tr the more hits it gets, the more, the more it'll trend. Give him a couple bucks too if you, if you. I gave him uh, enough money to become a character in the game. Um, uh, my red glasses will make it into the game. I'm so super excited. No? After maybe on Sunday morning. I don't know. Um, no, my red glasses are making it. I'm going to be the evil uh, shopkeep and I'm a recurring character. So I'm actually pretty uh, stoked about this whole thing. Um, <laughs> but um, he's using the Infinity Engine. And one of the things he told me was um, he's got um, eight different VR headset platforms built into it. It also plays without a, a VR headset. But, and it just struck to me like, here he is, you know, it's, what is it, 2016, and he's dealing with eight different 
headset platform APIs that he has to deal with, right? And some are have more stuff than others, and you know. Um, and then we have traditional industries and supplies chains exploding. The whole, obviously, autonomous vehicles is, is but but the whole auto industry is changing in terms of 3D printing and um, access to shared transportation and charging stations and you name it. There's a whole bunch of things that all need to be connected and all those connection points are actually opportunities for technology. And uh, something that, we, that we've been dealing with in, in the marketing world and one of the reasons why CMO for Hire uh, in, in my uh, humble estimation is right on the money is that the marketing technology stack is also getting uh, wider and deeper. So as of March, there was like 3,874 different marketing solutions like MailChimps and your HubSpots and your analytics and your you name it. And all these things kind of hook together. Um, even advertising platforms, I mean, you know, you think of AdWords and it's one of those. There's Google AdWords right up there and Bing's in there as well, right? But Bing. that's, yeah. Bing, you know, let us, who's I know, I know. Huh? I, know. I will say this about Bing. I will say this about Bing. 30% of, of, of internet traffic, search traffic goes to Bing, except if your clients are natural PC users, which uh, when in our world, a lot of our B2B users, um, they produce industrial software or tax software or whatever, your the accountants or whatever, they all have PCs. So it's up to 50% search that's attributed to Bing um, just because of the pre-installed um, But that's always browsers. in Microsoft's mm -hmm. stick. It's just like, right, let's throw it in the package and we'll get a market value. We'll, we'll, we'll get a you know, portion of the market. You're like, that's very cool. <laughs> and, and they don't have to think that hard because they just have to basically Google all of the AdWords, inter or, uh, you know, copy Google's AdWords interface to the extent, I don't know if any, anybody run Bing ads in here? Um, so. Sorry? They're trialing out install ads now. They're what? Out install ads on AdWords. Right. 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 Oh, terrible? Yeah, well, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if I was trying to do an iOS app, I wouldn't necessarily go for Bing, for sure. Um, the. Uh, I was going to say uh, Bing ads. Oh, no, they have this really cool button that says copy Google ad campaigns. You just click it and it copies it over and then you put it in and then everything's more or less set up kind of quasi the same. So we make all our changes in Google Not AdWords and just, really work, and just, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah, exactly. Right. But, um, yeah, so that's, it, it's just, it's an interesting thing because every single technology that we think about now, it not only has a wide scope, but it's also deep. The technology stacks are many, many different layers. They all have different players. They all need to be connected. And, um, and even like all of these guys have APIs, but we talk about this at CMO for Hire. We're building a, 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 we're building a platform, a marketing platform, because there's not enough. <laughs> we're connecting stuff, but the connection of that stuff is all very frail, frail as well because the API is morph around and then you have to think about how you're going to approach those things and um, yeah, it's, a, it's crazy. However, we shall overcome, I always say this, we'll get through, through this together everybody. <laughs> um, this is um, uh, my buddy Paul presenting at uh, Mobile Monday Peer Awards in Mobile World Congress. I don't know if that still exists, does it Dario? It does. It does. Yeah. yeah. So here's the thing about, so um, my, the reason I started Mobile Monday was for two reasons. One is that if you're going to be the Beatles, you better have a Liverpool scene. Or if you're going to be a Nirvana, you better have a Seattle scene, right? So the whole point of Mobile Monday was to create a scene and some activity. And if you think about it, this organization should be the premier org technology organization in Calgary, frankly, because everything's about mobile, right? Um, so that was the first reason. And then secondly, I knew once we formed it, and that's why they wanted to form it by the end of the year, because once we formed it, we were allowed to send people and, uh, for peer award review, and we actually got Mob for Hire into this global presentation. And I figured there's like 50 companies over two days that presented, but it gave us great leverage, right? Can you imagine, you know, we're able to come back and talk to our investors here and say we won a Mobile Monday peer award, and we also produced at, at uh, Mobile World Congress and stuff, so. So that was all good. And uh, I will say this about Mobile Monday, guys. Um, uh, maybe the reason why it doesn't work so well as an international organization is because there are a bunch of guys like us. <laughs> and it's like somebody else should take care of that maybe. Um, but it's a bunch of developers, right? And so when, once you make those friendships and stuff, it goes, it goes a, a long way. Uh, in terms of Mobile Monday, for sure, this is about getting involved and spreading the word and connecting locally and globally and bringing more people out to this 
um, event. Um, from my perspective, it, this is actually an amazing time to be in Alberta. We have been swimming in a seal of oil and gas for as long as I can remember. Um, and I've always been a big uh, proponent of tech diversification and it's happened despite some of the stuff that's actually happened in the province to a certain extent. But the good news is, is there's, um, if anybody see the AEC Alberta deal flow study from 2012 to 2016, there's a 48 in increase, 48 percent increase in technology companies in Alberta, which is phenomenal, right? Um, two, uh, coming in 2017, the details still aren't fully realized yet, but there is an investor tax credit. So if you are looking for an angel investment, $100,000 into your company will give that guy a $30,000 um, credit in on his taxes. So. Um, and that was implemented in a number of different provinces. It was implemented back in 2007 in BC. Uh, it was called the BCIT. And uh, I remember being in Mob, uh, Mob for Hire, I'd present it there and I'd win an award, it was great. Um, and then I talked to an investor and he goes, you know, I've got a risky venture here in Vancouver and I got you and I get $30,000 $30, with my investment here, but I get nothing from you, so I'll just pick these guys. So it was tough. And then of course, you couldn't shake any money out of the uh, oil tree at that point. So. Um, yeah, and then, so, so that's, I think that's very um, uh, great for our um, province. And then the last thing is that there's a lot of money coming down uh, for either in grants and or the, there's a new um, $10 million Accelerate Fund 2 uh, that's available now. Um, Digital Alberta uh, also announced a 1.5 digital media grant. So if you're making movies or games or whatever, that's all digital media stuff. ATB's got some great stuff going on. Alberta Innovates or... Uh, I don't think they're called that now. It's going to call something else, but it's where the vouchers come from. So there's a $10,000 voucher there, there's a $100,000 voucher there. You can get anywhere from up to a quarter of a million dollars from those guys. You got to write some proposals for sure. <laughs> but there's money there, which is actually very, very promising. So I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I love, uh, yeah. And, and everyone in the government's extremely, from my perspective, extremely happy to, to help out. Another place that we go to, um, for other people to help us as developer pro programs. Uh, uh, WIP is a company out of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Carolyn Luco is the leader of that. Um, and um, they do a great job of being communities for different developer programs. So there's 278 different programs accessible, which really kind of underlies the fact that there's a whole bunch of different APIs out there and they all want to be the number one platform. So, um, How many people have been to MWC, Mobile World Congress? One lady in the back. It's lonely, isn't it? I've been there twice. It's, I love it so much. I can't wait to go back, but I don't get to go this year. Um, but what a great place to go and meet what's and get the leading edge of what's going on and all the stuff about the connectivity and things like that. Um, there's so much to be learned over there and leveraged. In fact, when we went over there a couple of times, we went on that ticket right there, which is the Canada Trade Commissioner Service. They have a Canadian pavilion and they have a mandate to fill it with companies from each province. So if you if only two and if they have to have two Alberta people and and only two Alberta companies apply to it, guess who gets picked? So did they pay for everything. Um, they did not pay for my flights, but they paid for the everything at the trade show. The hotel. They did not pay for the hotel. Um, however, <laughs> now this is 2008. There's probably more money in it now, right? 2009. Um, and we roomed with six people. It was uh, in right downtown in Barcelona, and uh, it was awesome. I th and I remember it, kind of. <laughs> no, it was a good, those are, those are good times, yep. Um, and, that, um, and that is more or less it, guys. Thanks so much for the journey.